So today we're joined by a very special guest. We have with us former Wales captain Danny Gavadon. How are you doing, Danny? I'm very well, boys. How are you? Wales captain. I love, I've not had that introduction yet. Normally people go like through my previous clubs and all that or say 49 caps, which like still annoys me. But Wales captain is like, that's a great start to my morning, that boy. So uh, <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Uh, so how have you coped during these strange times we're living in? Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's been difficult. I'm not going to lie. Um, I think like the first lockdown we had seemed a little bit easier. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because it was maybe new. The weather was different. Um, that one seemed to kind of go quite quickly. But this kind of second one now, I think, has been a lot harder. And, you know, I've got like a five-year-old um, boy who just started like kind of homeschooling. So maybe that's been like a big factor, a bit of a stress, kind of getting him to sit in front of a kind of a, a laptop, an iPad, like what we're doing here and kind of, you know, do his lessons for school has been quite difficult at times. And i got a stepdaughter who's, you know, 14, 15. So she's like started her GCSEs and all that. So, you know, she's been having to kind of fend for herself as well with the homeschooling and stuff because I can't, I can't help her with what, she's learning like the, the the world's changed from when I was 15 and stuff so um the main thing has been yeah probably the more the kids really uh, myself um I, I, yeah no I, as you know I think some days you probably feel a bit lower than others and stuff and you know trying to keep yourself motivated and um getting yourself out of the house now and again when you can uh, to go for a walk and things like that it's obviously good to clear the mind and things like that but yeah, some days have been hard, but I've probably been quite lucky working in the media. I've still been able to get out and and work, really. You know, a lot of people in this period have not been able to work or have been furloughed and stuff that are working from home. I, I've been lucky where I've been able to still go out to, to kind of games and stuff and, and and do what I enjoy. So that's kind of kept me sane, really, but, but very much kind of like you guys, you know, life's changed so much and, you know, a year has gone past without even realising it, really. Um, but but hopefully, yeah, hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel. Boris came out and gave us some positivity, didn't he, uh, the, yesterday and stuff with a, a way forward for the next few weeks. So hopefully there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel now. We can all get back to some some normality very soon. So looking at your career, you started at West Brom, then spent five years at Cardiff before going to West Ham, QPR, Crystal Palace, and then returning back to Cardiff. Yeah. How did it feel leaving Cardiff the first time after you spent five years here? Um, yeah, it was like mixed emotions, really. Because um, there was there was a part of me that felt it was maybe time for me to go. Because um, I felt, you know, that period I did develop quite a lot as a player. That's when I kind of broke into the Wales team as well. Um, and it was a little bit strange because I think, at that point, I think we might have been maybe Division 2 or when I broke into the Wales team for the first time. So I was going away and training with the likes of Ryan Giggs and stuff. And then I was coming back and, you know, then playing against Division 2 teams and stuff. And it just felt a little bit strange. So it got to a point where when I'd kind of proven I could kind of play that level then, I then had that kind of hunger to want to kind of, you know, step to the next level and show what I could do. So... So by the time I kind of left, um, one, I felt like I was ready to go and I wanted to go to the Premier League and and see what I could do there. Um, but obviously then it was sad to leave because I'd been there, you know, as you say, for five years and, you know, a massive part of my development was was had kind of playing for Cardiff and, you know, playing in front of the, the amazing fans and stuff. And I had some really good kind of memories there and stuff. So it was kind of a bit... It was an emotional one, really. But in the end, I kind of had no choice, really, as well, because the club were in a bit of like financial trouble at the time as well. Um, so as you guys probably know, that kind of season, there were players just kind of being sold towards the end of the season because the club almost went into administration. So the likes of Gray and Kavanagh left and, you know, we, we we came into the dressing room one morning and he was just gone. And then you come in the next day, there was another one gone. It was strange. So by the end of the season... Uh, players needed to be sold um, 
And it was one of them really, you know, West Ham had come in with a bid and it it, it had to happen really because um, the club were in such financial kind of trouble. So it kind of suited the club and it suited kind of me because I, I thought I was ready to kind of play at that next level. So obviously you've played at many clubs over your career. Um, what was it like constantly moving from club to club? And like, do you feel, did you ever feel settled at a club? Um. I was probably one of the lucky ones. I think you look at a lot of other players throughout their career, they probably move a lot more. Or I think myself, towards the end of my career, I started moving a little bit more. And that tends to happen when you get towards the back end of your career where, you know, clubs don't want to give you long contracts. You end up getting a year here, a year there and stuff. And you end up probably moving a little bit more. But I think if you look at my early part and the main part of my career, I was quite lucky. So I spent... Obviously, I did my youth kind of career at West Brom, broke into the first team there. And so I was there probably, you know, three, four years. And I went to Cardiff for five years. West Ham was pretty much five years. And then that's when it kind of then, I started moving a little bit more. So I had one season, obviously, at QPR, a couple of seasons at Crystal Palace, and then kind of back back to Cardiff, really. So I was quite lucky in that respect. A lot of footballers move around a lot more frequent than that. And I was quite lucky as I stayed in around the London area as well. I kind of hit all the London clubs. So it wasn't really like, you know, I was playing in London and I had to move up north and, you know, where it's a big kind of change in environment and uh, moving one end of the country to the other. I was quite lucky with the clubs all being around London. I didn't really have to move too much, really. Um, so it's always a little bit strange, you know, particularly towards the end of my career when I was moving a bit more, I didn't really like it too much. You ask any player, they, they really want security and, um, you know, a, a decent left contract so you can kind of settle down and be comfortable. But, you know, by the end, when I kind of got to my thirties and stuff, it was really difficult to get more than one year contracts. You know, nobody wanted to really kind of give them out. So, so QPR was a one year contract with an option of a second year. If I, made a certain amount of appearances um, and I thought I was going to hit those appearances and then Mark Hughes came in as manager and didn't really play me towards the back end of the scene so I, I was about two appearances short and then they wouldn't renew my contract for a second year so I left there I went to Crystal Palace then on a I think it was a one-year contract uh, with an option of another year if we got promoted and stuff like that which we ended up getting promoted which was crazy because you know, nobody thought he was going to do that. So, so I ended up having two good years there, which could have easily been one year. And then, and then, yeah, then went back to Cardiff and did did a year there and didn't really play. So, so yeah, it's not ideal the short term contracts, but a lot of footballers do, particularly towards the end of their career or the lower league players. It happens to them a lot where they're on short term deals and they're moving about a lot and stuff like that. But I was probably one of the luckier ones with the moves I had. Um, you know four or five clubs and all of them really most of them around London so it went too bad it went too bad to be fair and you played in some huge games in your club career FA Cup finals playoff finals what would you say is your greatest memory in a club shirt oh that's a that's a good question um <clears throat> I yeah I've probably got to say the the promotions that I've experienced to be fair obviously um the ones with Cardiff City were amazing. The, the playoff final at the, um, well, they then called Millennium Stadium against QPR was was amazing because um, it was there was big pressure on that as well because um, we'd obviously spent a lot of money on players. Uh, Summer Man had come in. We spent a lot of money on players. We, you know, he, he was desperate to get the team up to the Premier League and the money that was spent, there was a lot of pressure on us to get promoted. Um, and... We, players we had we probably should have been more around the automatic promotion thing but that was amazing memory because obviously you know the finals at the Millennium Stadium um, and I'd like been injured about four or five for four or five months of that season so I'd not long come back before the end of the season so um, you know there was big pressure on that game so I just remember yeah that it was an awful game but um just the atmosphere from the fans and stuff was amazing. Um, obviously, the FA Cup giant killing as well. I'll never forget that when we beat Leeds United um, at the old Ninian Park. So that's one that lives in the memory. Um, 
but yeah, any of the promotions really, you know, the promotion with Crystal Palace in the in the final against Watford was a was a great day because we weren't really favourites to win that one. Um, and I have to obviously put the probably the FA Cup final in as well um, against Liverpool for West Ham, which we we lost on penalties. So um, I've been yeah fairly lucky to have played in some in some big games. Um, and you know that's not really to mention the obviously some of the international games and stuff as well, and making my debut and things like that. But um, I'd probably say yeah, uh, any of the the promotion games really. Like you said, you've had an amazing career. Um, do you have any regrets during your career? Um, no, not really. Um, I think you always kind of look back after and think maybe there's things you could have done different. I could have acted different in that situation and what have you, but um, it, it is what it is really. Um, I don't know. Hindsight's always a, a wonderful thing, I would say. And if I look back, maybe sometimes, um, I don't know, I don't know if I say be more professional, but I don't know. I was like, sometimes for me, it'd be quite easy to, I wouldn't say sulk, but get like frustrated about things a bit too easily. Or, you know, if I didn't like what was happening in training, sometimes I could be a bit like moany and sulky and stuff like that. And, um, and certainly I kind of realized then um, when I had a big kind of injury laugh and was out for a long time that, you know, when I came back, I kind of like appreciated the game and training everything so much kind of more because uh, I didn't think at one point maybe I would come back from my injury and play at all so when I did come back it just made me kind of appreciate football and any training session I did um, it just made me um, a lot more professional and, and appreciate the game a lot more than maybe what I used to before I think it's quite easy to take things for granted but um, no I don't really regret anything maybe some moments where with regards to my injuries, where I kind of put my faith in certain people, certain physios to get me back fit, you know, people who I thought maybe knew what they were talking about, you know, looking back, obviously, you know, they, they didn't and stuff, but um, but no, I, I can't really say any big regrets, really, because I think the mistakes that you kind of make and stuff, obviously, you know, you learn from them and it makes you kind of a, a stronger person and stuff like that, and um kind of molds who you are and stuff so so even like the negative stuff or some of the negative stuff I did or you know negative people I had kind of around me and stuff I can't really blame them looking back uh, maybe at the time it was a bit of frustration but looking back now it's kind of just all part of was all part of the journey really and at the time probably you know things I couldn't really can control too much but then looking back on the events and stuff now you probably think you could have done things different but once you're in the situation it's just I suppose it is what it is so um so now no 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 regrets even the mistakes i think um have helped to kind of make me you know a stronger person and, and, and who i am now so <clears throat> and obviously with wales you uh you narrowly missed out on euro 2004 how tough of a pill to swallow was that and <laughs> obviously that also helped make you more determined yeah. as a player yeah it was um yeah getting getting um because obviously you know we got off to a a great start in our group as well I think we won the first four games you know every, it was a similar feel to obviously what happened with the, the qualifying campaign for year 2016 where you know we'd won the first four games all the fans were kind of buying it like the Millennium Stadium was like sold out it was ridiculous you know 70 odd thousand watching the, the the home games and stuff it was it was mad um but then we just fell off a cliff you know we were lucky really in the end to get kind of a playoff place then um and we had a few injuries you know i missed a couple of games in the qualifying with injuries you know important games and stuff and we kind of like fell over the line a little bit in the end but it was getting because obviously we went to russia and did the hard work and got the nil nil draw and I think we all thought coming back then, what a great chance this is now at home to kind of finish things off. And we just didn't, we didn't perform. It was, it was getting, you know, at, at the time, you know, I was still a fairly inexperienced player, you know, at the international level. That was my first real qualifying campaign. Um, so it was difficult to take, difficult to kind of understand really. I probably didn't understand the, the magnitude 
how, how important that game was and what would have happened really if we'd won it, you know, to go to a kind of a major tournament would have been incredible. And obviously to uh, to experience it from a, a different side, seeing what the lads did in, in 2016, it would have been amazing to have been part of that as a player in, in kind of 2004. But, you know, at the end of the day, we just weren't good enough when we really needed to. Um, you know, we put ourselves in a good position, as I said, and we just weren't able to kind of see it out, which is disappointing because we had a good kind of squad of players. Um, we had a really good kind of start on 11. And that was probably the biggest issue, really, then when we had a few injuries. We, um, you know, the start on 11 got weakened a bit and then we, we didn't get the results we needed. Whereas, you know, you look at the, the, the boys from 2016, that qualifying campaign, most of the key players all stayed fit, didn't they, all through the qualifying? And, you know, that's a massive thing to have. So, yeah, that's one of them still sits with me still. You know, if I see any pictures and stuff, I see like, always see a picture. Um, I don't know who took it of me walking off the pitch after that game. I've got like my boots taken off and I'm carrying them off in my hand and stuff. And I just look like I'm going to cry. Like, I just look like I look so like disappointed. Um so yeah, it's it's still one that annoys me really because that was a big opportunity yeah, to play in a major tournament, and not not every player gets to do that. So um, yeah, thanks thanks for reminding me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned um, your greatest memory in a club shirt. So what is your greatest memory in a Wales shirt? Oh, um, I'd probably have to say making my debut really. Um, because I didn't have too many amazing memories in a in a world show, unfortunately. Um, we, I don't know how many games we won when I was playing, but um, it certainly wasn't what this current kind of world team are doing now. What they've done over the last few years, you know, it was what what these lads are doing now is amazing. Um, but we didn't really have that kind of feel when I was playing. You know, we go into games and you're just thinking, you know, what chance have we got here and stuff like that. Um, we always tended to get tough groups and playing against, you know, the, the bigger nations and stuff. But, you know, over the last couple of years with the success the boys have had, it's made it a bit easier in that respect where the groups are a little bit easier for us now. But um, I probably have to say my, probably my debut or even just getting my first kind of Wales call up, even for the under 18s was like a, a massive, a massive thing for me because, I didn't play like any of the younger age groups. Um, I always went on, you know, trials for the Wales um, teams and stuff. And as a youngster, never, never got picked. Um, you know, the victory shield thing that used to happen every year under 15 level, like always was desperate to play. And that I used to watch on, on the TV on Sky and never got picked for that. Um, and then obviously I, I went to West Brom as a 16 year old and within a season, then I'd got a call up for the under 18. So, you know, I still remember when that kind of letter came through and my youth team manager there then um, kind of got all the, the all the youth team squad together and kind of read out the letter in front of the whole team saying I'd been called up for, for the under-18s. And I was just like in shock, really, because it was just something I didn't didn't expect. So um, I'd, I'd have to say that moment or or making my debut against against the Czech Republic, which was a, was a big thing as well. Um, I think I'd been in one of the senior squads or been on the bench for a game before that. I think it was against Argentina. I got called up from the 21s and then, um, and then yeah, made my debut against the Czech Republic at home um, at left back. So um, that was a was an interesting one. But but thankfully, I think I'd been playing kind of left wing back for Cardiff at the time, so it didn't feel unnatural to me. Um, but yeah, it was a that was a something that lives in lives in the memory as well obviously i've still got the shirt and everything from from my debut and stuff so uh i probably say what either the 18s or or making my senior debut either one really <clears throat> and obviously you got injured for five months between uh november 2002 and april 2003 uh how tough mentally was it being on the sidelines and being forced to watch Yes, yeah, it's, it's the worst. Yeah, you ask any kind of footballer what they hate the most, and it's it's being injured and not being able to be out there and perform and and do what you you know you can do to help help the team. Um, 
so that was yeah that was a tough period for me because that was probably my first you know proper injury really and it was it wasn't like a injury so much that you can kind of see and stuff like that either it was a you know, problem with my back which I'd been having um for I'd probably say it started when I was at West Brom to be fair um but it was something where it would kind of stiffen up and in at the start of games and stuff and it got to a point where I just had to stop playing and say look I need to sort this out so but I didn't think it'd take like almost five months so I, I literally had to go back to basics of stripping everything back and learning like how to control my kind of core stability and breathing and everything it was like the start of it was very like boring and you know you're almost thinking what am I doing this for like what's this actually doing and stuff and then I just had to slowly build myself up and by the time I got back it was almost five months so um, it was difficult but it was just great to get back before the end of that season obviously come back at a, an important time in the season when um you know, where the team needed needed my help really to kind of get over the line. So, so it, it was tough. But I think those moments they kind of make you stronger. You find out about yourself. You know, things don't always go according to plan as a footballer. There are ups and downs and stuff, and it is a test of your mentality. And it probably helped me later on as well because I I was you know when I played for West Ham I had a longer period of injury where I was actually out for a season and pretty much a season and a half. So that was really difficult, but maybe the previous experience of that injury probably helped me mentally um, to be able to deal with, with the situation, but it's, it's hard. It, it is hard when you're not being, not in routine, you're not training, you're not able to play and you don't really know when you're coming back and the fans are all asking you questions, when are you going to be back? And you can't really answer them. And, um, you get a lot of the same questions kind of every day and stuff. And it's, it's hard, you know, you're in the gym every day doing the same kind of things every day. And it's a real test of your kind of character and mentality and stuff. So, um, so that's kind of why I say, you no, know, I don't have any regrets really. Cause I think about those peers when I was injured and it just helped to kind of make me a lot mentally stronger and probably appreciate the game a lot more when I, when I came back. So, um, you know, I, I still remember um, that period when I was injured at West Ham, um, Craig Bellamy was there at the time and um, he, we were both kind of injured together. And I always remember him kind of coming up to me and kind of just giving me a pat on the back really and saying, oh, look how impressed he was with how hard I kind of worked to kind of get back and stuff. And that was something that still sticks in my mind because to get kind of praise from Bellas, you, you have to... Uh, <laughs> you have to have done something right. And I think he probably saw how hard I'd worked and maybe didn't think I had that kind of strength of mind to maybe work as hard as I did. And I didn't really know at the time, maybe I had that strength of mind and mentality as well. So, um, so that's kind of always something that sticks in my mind. What he, what he kind of said to me um, in that period, but it's, it's, yes, nobody wants to be injured and, you know, you always want to be out there performing and trying to help the team you just feel a bit lost really you almost feel like you don't want to pick your wages up when you're injured because you don't deserve them so um yeah they're, they're difficult periods and some players handle them I suppose a bit a bit bit better than others I'd say so you just mentioned the mental toughness there and you obviously suffered from depression between 2006 and seven. So like, how did you overcome that? And like, what advice would you pass on to people? Like, especially during these times? Mm. Um, I'd say the biggest thing is, you know, everybody kind of says it and it sounds a bit cliche now, but just to like, just to talk and explain how you feel um, and get your feelings off your chest. Cause that's one thing that I wasn't very good at. I, I felt like I could deal with every issue myself and um, was fairly shy and quiet when I was younger and um, found it hard to maybe say what was going on in my mind and how I was feeling. And, and that at the time was a big or a bad thing, I, th I think, to do. So, you know, at that, at that point, um, you kind of think you're all right, but you're not. You don't really realize it at the time. Um, you just think, right, i got to get through this. You're working hard. You're trying to get back fit. You're, you're thinking that you're feeling okay and stuff. But 
but you're actually not. Um, so like the biggest thing for me in that period, and one of the things I've learned since then, and what I try to do now is be a bit more open with my feelings and say what's what's on my mind. You know, I'm still not kind of perfect at it, but but it, it definitely helps to kind of be honest and talk to someone, whether it's your mum and dad or your, your best friend or, you know, your wife, whatever it is. Um, it's kind of just like bottling everything up inside and then trying to deal with everything yourself. It's just not always, not always possible. And you, I think you always tend to feel instantly better once you've, you know, you're open and have got things kind of off your chest. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a, a difficult period for me. Um, I, um, this certain things I had to do. Yeah. I had to kind of look at myself and try and change myself a little bit. Um, you know, I went to see a, um, a psychologist as well for a little bit. There was a club psychologist that came in at West Ham. Um, so I saw a little bit when I got back playing, um, and that was more to do with kind of positive thinking. So it was, um, to do with the, the NLP. I don't know if you've heard of NLP, that, the new linguistic programming. So it's kind of like programming your mind to be positive and saying positive statements and things like that and control it, being able to con just control your mood, really. You know, if you're feeling in a bad mood when you wake up, then you should be able to just make yourself feel in a good mood kind of thing. So, so I did a little bit of that as well, um, which helped. And yeah just looking at myself really and saying look if this happens the, again or whatever or moving forward you know I, I can't really be this person anymore I need to I need to change I need to be more open I need to ex express what's you know going on in my mind and stuff and let people kind of in to help me and that's how I've tried to be really ever since that period so I, I, I did learn a lot from that period it was a tough period um but I learned a lot about myself and, you know, some of the things that I shouldn't do and some of the things I needed to do, you know, coming out the other side of it as well. So. And you did unfortunately receive racist abuse in your career. Um, since then a lot has been done to combat it, but do you think enough is being done or do you think there should be more? Um, well, I think you only have to look at, you know, what's been going on, like on social media in, in, in regards to that. Um, and of course, I think there can always be more done. Um, I think it's great, obviously, that people are kind of coming out and sharing their experiences and talking about it. That's one of the powerful um, tools that social media brings. People can instantly kind of voice their opinions and um, can speak about their experiences and stuff. And, and people can see that um and kind of resonate with it i suppose um, but then of course the flip side is you've got people who are able to throw these racist comments out there uh, directly to people as well um which i just find just crazy and i can't understand why after a game of football why somebody would want to think about you know posting up racist remarks and stuff it just doesn't make any sense to me but um I think, look, I think it's good that people are now talking about it. Um, people are now being made a, more aware of it. Um, is there enough probably being done? I'd probably say no. I think that is the issue. It's always about the action. There always seems to be a lot of talk and um, people sharing their experiences now. But then off the back of that and, you know, different slogans and campaigns and all that, but off the back of that, has there been real real change with anything no I don't think there has um so more more definitely needs to be done for sure um and as I you know I said it you know it starts with the authorities you know the owners of Facebook the owners of Instagram um the people in high powered positions who can make decisions who can affect change these are the people who need to um start making some decisions um, and, and whether they will or not, I don't know, because I think the problem you have is, um, you know, we talk about people coming out and talking about their experiences and stuff, which is great because if you haven't experienced racism before, it's hard to kind of understand. Um, but I think for effective change to happen, you probably need a few of these people in those high power positions, people who have experienced these these situations um so can understand it 
and then understand maybe what needs to be done. I think that's part of the problem. There isn't enough kind of diversity probably um, at the top end uh, with regards to these these high powered jobs. Um, and at the end of the day, it would take these people shifting out of the way, wouldn't it, to <laughs> to promote that change and get these people involved. So that's that's the problem, really. So I think a lot of these people who are in these high power positions, they they want to support these things that are going on and they'll say, yes, I agree with this, blah, blah, blah. But then when it comes to making changes, they don't really want to then get involved because they then realise, oh, well, actually, my job might be on the line here because if there's going to be effective change, probably a lot of these people who have experienced racism and stuff are going to want to take my job, really. So <laughs> I think that's where the, where the problem lies. You know, there's always a lot of support, but then there's probably not a lot of action because if there's going to be action, that might then mean, well, actually, it's a threat to to my job. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen moving forward. We can only do what we're doing. People continuing to share their experiences, uh, trying to, to educate people on the on the situation. But I don't think you're ever going to totally eradicate racism. To be honest with you, I just think you know the world's too diverse. There's so many different religions and different opinions and stuff like that. And and people, as I say, in those high power positions who are probably now fearful of their own livelihoods and their own jobs because for effective change to happen, as I say, these are the type of people that are probably gonna have to have to step out of the way. So um more yeah, more, more there's still a lot more that can be done, but whether it does happen, I'm I'm, I'm not so sure. <clears throat> in relation to that. Like obviously in 2012, you would have been involved with the Palace team, and you would have probably been in training with like Wilfred Zaha and stuff. So what what's your take on him standing against taking the knee? I'm kind of a bit torn either way, to be fair, because I can understand what he's saying, um, how he feels that maybe the the whole thing has kind of run its course. I think he probably feels a similar way to what I've just said there, where what's the point a little bit because he, he doesn't see any action kind of coming from it um you know he almost feels it's a little bit degrading to take the knee um which you know i can understand what he's trying to say but then on the flip side as well i do think it's important to to try and keep it going even if it's you know you you change the gesture from taking the knee to something different i i feel to start promoting change obviously we need to start with the kind of the younger generation and try and educate them so you know already I think there's been a lot of a lot of young people who have maybe seen players taking a knee and have asked their father or their mother look what what's he doing there kind of thing and then the parents had to explain what it is and and that's where you start that's where you start educating these these young people so I can see it kind of both ways. I can see why him and there's been a few other players maybe don't want to do it anymore. And look, that's up, up to them. You know, it's not kind of compulsory for people to do it. But then on the flip side, I do feel that it, something like this kind of needs to continue. It continually needs to be kind of rammed home, the message, whatever that message is, whatever the gesture is, I still feel it needs to kind of continue. Because um, if, if it doesn't, then... You know how is it? How is there going to be change, or how are you going to try and affect it? You know, if you just stop doing or stop campaigning, stop doing the slogans, stop doing the messages and stuff, then we're just going to end it right back to where we were before, really. Um, and nothing, you know, no one's going to be influenced into maybe having to do something. So, so I, I'm torn, really. I'm torn. Um, I, I'd probably like to see Will continue to kind of do it. But I also kind of respect his opinion on it and, and why he feels maybe um, the whole thing's run its course a little bit. Because I think, you know, black people, they just don't see anything really changing. They almost feel like, oh, well, we're doing this, you know, but what for? What, what, what are we really getting out of it? What are we, who are we influencing? Um, and I think as it, it is as much about educating, obviously, the younger generation with it. But I think a lot of people are obviously doing it as well because they, they want to look upwards as well to the people who, as I said, you know, the people who are important, who can 
who can promote this change and try and affect them to do something different. And that's the problem, really. Um, I don't think a lot of black people see that um, as changing any anytime soon with, with what they're doing. So I think that's where you're seeing more players now, maybe just thinking, well, what's the point of this? Nothing, nothing's going to come of it. So, um, so I, I respect his decision, but I would, I, I probably would have liked to have seen him continue to do it. Or even if he does something different, maybe, which I think he said, look, you he prefer to kind of stand tall. Um, if there can be a, maybe a different gesture or something or different thing that they can do uh, to make it kind of their own thing rather than it being linked to a kind of a political movement or, or whatever it is as well, then, you know, I'd be all for that as well. So um, it's it's disappointing to hear, but, you know, he's not the only one. There's a, there's a fair few players kind of with the same kind of thinking at the minute which is a little bit disappointing and just shows how people are thinking about it really that they don't really see anything really is, is going to come from it and, and they're probably right to be honest with you because you know this has been going on for months now and we still haven't still haven't heard any change really yet in in any way have we so um we'll just have to we'll just have to wait and see what happens i suppose and obviously you did reach a point in your career when you decided to retire. How big was that decision for you? And um, did you ever feel scared that you were like leaving football behind? Yeah, it was, it was scared. Like I, I felt like I was ready. Um, I wasn't scared about, I suppose, retiring. Um, I got to a point where I wouldn't say falling out of love with the game, but I just felt ready probably to to bow out. You know, I went back to Cardiff. I wasn't really playing. Um, you know, I, I was a little bit frustrated. Um, I tried to get out of there and go and play. I, that didn't really happen. Um, and I don't know, I just got tired, I suppose. Got tired of it all. Like the way the, the game had, had changed a bit and... Um, I just felt like I wasn't probably enjoying it anymore. You know, I had a plan in my mind towards the end of my career. I wanted to it to go. I wanted to try and play as much as possible and try and enjoy it and stuff. And and that kind of happened when I was at Palace. But then when I went back to Cardiff, then um, it was just a strange, nothing kind of season, really. I think I, you know, I ended up Cardiff City manager before I actually started a game, I think, as a player, which was a bit weird, you know, being caretaker manager for a few games and stuff. Um, and I didn't really play, um, you know, found it hard there really to find a, a kind of purpose, really. If I wasn't playing, I ended up training a lot with the youngsters then and trying to help them and stuff, um, which I enjoyed. Um, and then by the end of the season, I just thought, well, maybe it's time to call it a day. I, I did try and I went to Leighton Orient after and trained for a couple of weeks there and thought maybe I can do one more season, but um, I just decided then, uh, nah, I think that's that's enough for me really. Uh, mentally and, and physically, the body wasn't, probably wasn't in the right place where I wanted it to be either. And I didn't want to like sign up, say another year's contract for another club and then not play to the level I wanted to, or, you know, end up maybe being injured for a lot of that season and stuff like that. And, just picking up my money for for no reason really. So, so I kind of knew it was time, um, but it was scary. Yeah, it was scary because it's all you've known for so long, and um, the first kind of few months were were really weird. Where you just you know you're able to just lie in bed and stuff, and you know, not have a reason really to kind of get up or no routine and stuff. Which for a few weeks is quite kind of nice because. It's very different to what you've been used to for so long. But then after a few weeks, you start panicking and I'm thinking, oh, wow, wow, I need to like get my house in order here and get my teeth into something else and stuff like that. So um, so it was hard. It was hard. Um, but I was fairly lucky in that respect that I kind of went straight into the media stuff straight away, really. Um, and I'd also had a plan um, with my agent towards the end of my career that I would work for the um, for the company as well when I finished playing in some capacity. So I didn't really know what, um, but then I decided that I wanted to kind of go like down the mentoring side. So with kind of the younger players, just looking after them and giving them advice and, you know, 
watch getting out and watching them play when I can and um, just trying to guide them through really and um, you know using some of the experiences that I've had as a player really so so I had a couple of things going on as soon as I finished so that was good so I wasn't too kind of um, I wasn't sitting around for too long and and thinking about you know like yesterday or whatever I was a footballer and stuff so I, I had to move on quite quickly which was good because a lot of footballers they maybe they don't have that next thing to do and they spend a year not doing anything and they get into bad habits you know gambling drinking whatever it is and they just struggle to fill that void but I was quite lucky that I had those two things I think I moved house as soon as I finished playing I'd moved into a new house my my girlfriend was pregnant at that time as well so I had like a lot of going on. So for that first year was good. Like my mind was occupied. I had to move on quickly. And it was probably more the second year then when I thought about it, not being a footballer anymore. And it kind of, and it hit home a little bit more. Um, so it was, yeah, it was the right time for me to, to retire. Um, I, I don't have no complaints about that. But I, yeah, I still, you know, I miss playing and I miss the camaraderie in the dress room and stuff. And, you know, some of the band and um, miss being out on a Saturday, but there's, there's some things I, I don't miss as well. You know, the game has changed now and VAR and um, some of the politics involved in football now with the money and stuff. You know, there's, there's some things I'm quite happy to to leave behind as well. So obviously since you retired, you joined the media side of football. Um, so like how quickly did you have to adapt to that industry and like how much was taught to you and how much was, did you have to like teach yourself? Yeah, it was a little bit of both really. And, and it was kind of adapting as quick as you can. So, um, so I kind of chose to kind of just throw myself into it and try and work and do as much and as much different types of media as I could to, to learn quicker. Um, you know, I thought about, maybe doing a, a journalism course. I'd, I'd looked at it and at something with a PFA, but it was, I think the course was up in, in Stoke and it would have been impossible for me with my situation to travel up there and back. And as I said, my girlfriend was pregnant at the time. She didn't drive or anything like that. So it just wasn't feasible. So, so I'd spoken to a few people I knew and a lot of people had said, look, just, you don't need to do the course, just throw yourself into it and learn on the job. So so that's what I decided to do. Um, and my plan really was to just not say no to any work, do as much work as I can, try and learn as quickly as I can. Um, I was doing all kinds of stuff. I was doing commentaries, you know, a little bit of a TV. Um, I was kind of writing articles, my own articles and stuff like that at the, at the start. Um, so I was just trying to do as much work as I can, not say no to any work, um, learn as quickly as I could. Um, and that was, a, that was a big help, really, because I found that you don't really get a lot of help from the companies. You don't get a lot of feedback. You know, they tend to kind of say, oh, look, we'll give you feedback, but it never really tends to happen. So, you know, a lot of it was learning off my own back, really. Um, and I got some help, a lot of good help as well from other journalists, I suppose, or working with other kind of commentators and stuff and just learning off them and picking their brains and, and them kind of giving me advice really. So it was, it was a bit of both really kind of being more proactive and kind of asking questions, which I'd never been used to. And that was probably one of the biggest changes from coming out of being a footballer to going into the media. Suddenly you have to put yourself out there and ask more questions and, Whereas as a football, everything's done for you as a football. You don't even have to ask any questions apart from maybe, you know, to your manager on a Saturday, what do you want me to do? Everything else is 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 done for you. So that was kind of a big change, really. You, you know, you're then expecting to go into the media, maybe work to kind of just come to you when it's not really like that. You know, you have to be more proactive and put yourself out there and ask for work, ask questions and you know, hassle people and stuff like that, which I never been used to. So, so that was a bit of a change, but yeah, it was just learning on a job, um, trying to work as much as I could and just, you know, picking the brains of the people who I was working with, asking questions and, um, and a bit of myself. Yeah. Learning myself. So, yeah. 
And obviously looking at the Wales team now, um, your former international teammate, Gareth Bale, is still probably Wales star man. Do you think Tottenham are getting enough out of him at the moment? <laughs> no, nowhere near. Um, look, I still think I still think Gaz has got plenty of petrol in the tank. He's still a fantastic player. Even, you know, when you look at prime Gareth Bale, even if he's now only able to play in kind of fourth gear, um, he's still better than most players. He can still produce and do amazing things. So, um, so I, I've been surprised of how little he's been used, really. Um, I weren't totally sure when he came at the start of the season because I know how like Mourinho likes to work and how he likes to play, how his teams like to set up. And they probably don't really suit the type of player that Gareth is now. I think if you look to when Gaz was in his prime, then he would probably be great for Mourinho now, the way they kind of sit back and then hit on the counter-attack. And we all know, you know, Gaz used to pick the ball up in his own half. He'd just dribble for the old team and score, put it in the top corner. Whereas now... He's probably a bit of a different type of player now. Um, so he probably doesn't suit Marino as much as um, with the way that he wants to play. But he's still like, he's still better than nearly every player there for me. So I'm surprised he hasn't played more. Um, and he, he, he's a great guy. Like he's honestly, he's like, he's the most model professional you'll ever, ever see. You know, never, never goes out, never drinks, you know, He's a family kind of person, just lives for football. That's why he's achieved what he has achieved, because it's all just been about football for him, nothing else. Um, so to hear kind of people questioning in this, that, the other about him at times is a little bit annoying because you won't get anybody that's more kind of dedicated than him or who will never cause a manager any trouble whatsoever. So, so it was nice to see him play well on the weekend when he came on against West Ham and just show people that he's still got it. And yeah, hopefully now he can stay fit and just get some get some game time and just play at that level we saw on the weekend because I think when he has been given opportunities, we haven't really seen that. He's been looked like a bit playing within himself or I don't know if that's because he's maybe just not felt 100% fit. But he looked he looked sharp on on that on the weekend against West Ham. So you know, if he plays like that, I'm sure you'll get more opportunities. And then obviously... That's great for Wales then with the, with the years coming up if we can get in um, at a level of fitness where he can uh, perform well um, and he's feeling confident and good about himself, then uh, that bodes well for Wales as well. So, um, yeah, he's, be, he's been used sparingly. They, they can definitely get more, get more out of him, I think. For the future of the Wales team, have you noticed any young players that could break into this side and maybe light up a tournament? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think in regards to with young players coming through, maybe not so much where they're going to be ready, maybe for this year's tournament, but we've got so many, so many good young players coming through with like the younger age groups. Um, I think the job that the FAW have done over the last few years to, um, with the scouting network and the way we've kind of picked players up and, you know, those kind of dual nationality players as well, who've had the opportunity maybe to play for England as well, you know, the likes of Ampadu and Brooks, people like that. Um, and we've managed to actually nab them just shows, I think, the kind of environment, I think, um, that these, these boys have kind of created and these younger players now come into it and they really enjoy it. They enjoy meeting up with the squad and, they just feel very comfortable, I think, in and around the kind of senior players. And it seems like an easy decision for them at the minute when they've got that decision over, over Wales and England, which is which is great. Um, but there's there's a lot of good young players coming through. Um, you know, obviously we've seen the likes of kind of Ampadu, what he's done um, in the last couple of seasons, still a young player, probably you know, making his first full season really as professional at Sheffield United this season. So, you know, that will hold him in good stead and certainly going into a major tournament for Wales. I think you'll see a different player to what we've already seen. I think he could be someone who could step up on that stage in a major tournament and really kind of take his game to the, to the next level. Um, obviously you've got the likes of, you know, Roden who's broken into the squad and you'd expect him to be a, a starter in that back four. Another one, I think who has still got levels to his game, but 
even like you know a younger age groups as well. You know, I think young Brennan Johnson, who um, has just well just got his first cap in the senior squad uh, and has been doing really well on loan at Lincoln, uh, Lincoln this season. He looks like a fantastic uh, prospect as well. Um, I've seen him a couple of times this season for Lincoln and. He looks a really good player. Um, there's just so many. Like we're, we're blessed in those kind of attacking areas as well. Um, you know, if everyone's fit, it's difficult to get everyone in the team. You know, like so Daniel James and David Brooks and Gareth Bale, Aaron Ramsey, who's been doing well at Juventus, and we're blessed in that area now, which is which is great. We're not so reliant on just the likes of Gareth Bale and Aaron Ramsey now to to win us games. So um, there's there's some good there's some good good boys coming through um who else i'm trying to think of maybe like from the the 21s and, and the 19s um there's a actually a lad who i mentor at cardiff city who's a, a good player as well who's just signed a new contract at um at cardiff city isaac davis who's a young striker there he's he's played for the 19s he's he's one to watch he's been in and around the cardiff first team last few weeks so you know, um, I have to mention him actually being his mentor and stuff. It'd be bad for me not to mention him. He'd be killing me um, if I don't. But but there's there's so many, like there's so many. For us being such a small nation, for us to be producing the amount of talent that we are over the last few years has been has been amazing. And obviously now we have um, kind of a manager and a pathway with these youngsters. If they're good enough, you know, they'll they'll get they'll get fast tracked up into the senior squad and not just into the squad, they'll actually play as well, which is, which is great, you know, great for these young lads. Um, it gives them a lot of confidence and um, for them to see like a pathway, uh, a pathway forward from the younger age groups. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of talent, a lot of talent there. And looking ahead to this summer, how far do you think Wales can go? And is this squad better than the one five years ago? Um, that's a good question. I would be surprised if this squad got to a semi-final. Um, I'd love it if they did or could go one further. Um, but in my opinion, I don't think this squad is as good as the 2016 squad. Um, just for the fact that, um, I just think more of the key senior players in that squad were on the top of their game. So you look at Gareth Bale and how he was performing then. You know, Aaron Ramsey in that tournament was just outrageously good. Joe Allen was ridiculous. Ben Davis, James Chester. Um, we just had so many players, all the senior lads, playing at the top of their games. Um, I think now you look at it, and certainly over the last kind of maybe year or so it's been probably the younger more inexperienced players outshining the senior players you know the likes of Gaz hasn't played too much Aaron Ramsey suffered with injury Joe Allen's been out injured for ages Ashley Williams obviously now is retired James Chester is kind of off off the scene so the team has changed so much and it's a lot more inexperienced now I would say in the attacking areas as I said we're probably a better team we have more options and um, more quality um, but I'd probably say defensively we're probably not as strong and obviously experience wise the squad is a lot more inexperienced so that would worry me a little bit going into a major tournament but um, but yeah I think I think the main difference is probably just the key the key players are match winners they were all at the top of their game in 2016 whereas now they're probably getting towards the back end of their career a bit and one or two of them are retired and stuff like that. Um, so it has weakened us in, in that respect. So um, to, I'd say to get out of the group would be a, a good achievement. I think it's a, it's a difficult group as well. Um, and if, if we can get through the group, then obviously then anything's kind of possible when it comes into those knockout games and stuff with them, you know, on our day, you know, we're fully with, fully loaded with everybody playing on the top of their game we're capable of giving anybody a good game um but just to get out of the group i'd be happy and i think we were probably saying that in 2016 when we weren't expecting too much we weren't expecting a semi-final you know we thought maybe if we can get out of the group that'll be a decent effort um 
So I just think no expectations, really, because I didn't think we was going to qualify, to be honest with you. After halfway through that qualifying campaign, I thought we were done, done and dusted. I did not see us get into the Euro. So the fact that we have is just a bonus for me. So whatever the, the lads do out there now, I'm, I'm really not too bothered. Um, but I think the quality that we have, we, we should be able to get through the group and then, and then see what happens from there. Right, so finally, we're going to do some player comparisons. We want to bring your opinion. Um, okay, okay. So the first one is, who would you choose between Hal robson Carney, obviously that wonder girl at yeah. the Euros comes to mind, or Luke Jeffcott? If you don't know who Luke Jeffcott is, he's a Plymouth. He Argonne. plays a Plymouth, yeah. yeah. And he's scoring. Banging the goals in. <laughs> so would you choose you for experience there? What, so what? What's this for, like? Is this just the pick in the squad, or is this for like, uh, oh, who's the better player, or like well, which one? For the squad. For the squad. Yeah. Oh, um, that's a good. That is a good question. Um, I'd probably have to go with Hal, just because, you know, I've heard of Luke and what he's been doing and the goals he's been scoring, but I haven't really seen him play too much. Um, you know, if this was Ryan Giggs, then he'd probably have a great chance because he loves bringing young players into the squad and stuff. Um, but I don't know, I'd probably go with with Hal just for his experience. Um, as I said, I think it is a squad that lacks a little bit of experience now. Um, you know, the senior players are are outnumbered really by the, by the younger ones now. Um, so I'd probably say Hal just for his experience. He, you know, he's been to a major tournament as well. He's got that legendary status with the goal he scored. So it'd be bad for me not to, not to pick him in the team. And I think until Luke gets his opportunity and does something similar to what Hal's done, I can't, I can't pick him over Hal. So uh, after, I'll go with Hal robson Carnu on that one. <clears throat> and then the starting lineup. Would you go for the youth of Ethan Ampadu or the experience of Joe Allen? Um, I would go with both. I would play both. <laughs> I think that's the perfect midfield for me. Um, I think I wouldn't go with one or the other. I'd have them both there. Um, look, I think the likes of Joe Morel as well has done outstandingly well, and that'd be a little bit probably harsh on him. But I think... Um, that is the combination, really. You know, obviously, we had Joe Ledley and Joe Allen that worked so well off each other, and losing Joe Ledley was a, a big blow for Joe Allen because they worked so well together. And we've been searching ever since, really, for that partner for Joe Allen. Um, and obviously, then we lost Joe to injury for a long time. And now he's back. Obviously, Ethan's come in into that central midfield role. He's played centre back at times and, and done really well. So I think it's not either or it's it's playing them both that is our midfield too for me if they're both fit and playing well i think those two complement each other really well and, and and play alongside each other so uh it's not it's not either or it's it's the, both of them playing for me <clears throat> if i had to choose between the importance of you know either player than Joe. It's, it's, it's Joe Allen for me. It has to be. It has to be. I'm sorry. Sorry, Ethan, but it's just Joe. And lastly, Cardiff City's Harry Wilson or Bournemouth's David Brooks? Oh, that, this is the best one of the lot. Best question of the lot. Uh, um, that is a very good question. Um, there's a lot of factors that come into this. I, I probably have to pick. What do I go? Do I go just on a Billy? Do I go on current form? Do I go on who stays fitter? Like this is a, this is a difficult answer. Um, I'm probably going to go with Harry Wilson. I'm probably going to have to go with Harry Wilson. I just think maybe not so much on, on ability. Look, they've both got great ability. Brooks maybe slightly more ability, but I just think Harry's been playing more regular and more consistent than 
and better affecting games more. I think Book started the season, he had that look like he'd come back off his injury and would start the season quite well, but then we haven't really seen too much of him since, have we? So um, I'd have to make this decision purely on on just form and, and who's been playing more, because I think ability-wise, they're both kind of very talented. So um, I'd have to go with, I have to go with Harry Wilson on that one. Who, who are you two going with there? Harry Wilson or Brooks? Come on, you tell me. For me, it has to be Harry Wilson. Yeah? He's got that free kick, free kick quality as well. Too. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, for me, he's, Harry Wilson. he's not. <laughs> Why? Why? He can't. He can't stay fit. I think, for me, at the highest level, when they yeah. both played in the Premier League, Brooks has affected yeah. games more in the Premier League than Wilson has. So, I factor that into my decision. Um, yeah, it's a little yeah, bit. Yeah. He's the classier player, isn't he? I think of the two. But he can't yeah. stay fit though. He can't even do 90 minutes. He's off yeah. after 60 minutes with cramping. We ran a poll on Twitter and uh Brooks got the overall majority. Yeah, I thought he probably would, but I think it was like 85% of people. Was it? Brooks. Really? Yeah. Wow. I can I can half understand that though, because he I think he is the silkier of the two players, isn't he? And he just does things that stick in the memory. Yeah. But then, as you say, Harry's got that. He can win you a game with a set piece or something like that. And you might not see him in a game sometimes, but then he'll, he'll whip a ball in or free kick or whatever. And they're diff- different players, to be fair, isn't they? But I want to change my mind now. <laughs> <laughs> After yeah. hearing that poll result, I want to, uh, I want to go with Brooksy now. <laughs> That is just yeah. public opinion, not yeah. a professional football mind. I suppose. Yeah, true. Plus, he could have played for England and he chose us as well. So I should always pick Brooks for that, just for that reason. So, uh, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. A very good question. But, yeah. We, thank you for joining us, Danny. We're done, yeah? Yes. My thank pleasure. You thank, you for, thank you for having me on, chaps. Mm-hmm.